All right, so let's move into this next chapter, chapter 5, dealing with transient conduction. So far we've done steady state conduction, now we're doing transient. So we were able to solve for ta temperature as a function of space, and then temperature as a function of two space, you know, x and y. And, and we even looked at numerical solutions for temperature distribution, steady state, and 2D. Now we're going to think about adding time. And so we're going to have the temperature, the simplest would be a function of time, then get more complicated, time and space, or even temperature is a function of time and two or more space variables. It gets fairly complicated. Well, this is our starting point. Temperature is only a function of time. These two sections, it's the method of lumped capacitance or lumped capacity. And we want to really dominate this. This is very important in the study of heat transfer. This section 5.3 is a generalized lumped capacitance for radiation only, blah, blah, blah. I'm going to just tell you, just, we're just going to skip it, okay? It's the first two sections that are really important. Then, when you get down to spatial effects, what do you think they have included when they talk about 5.4 and beyond, spatial effects? Time and space, both with X only and as, as well as X and Y. So that's the, the layout for this chapter. So what about lumped capacity method? Well, let me do this. Let me introduce a review. And this goes back to your previous studies. And as a review, I just sketch something and it jogs your memory. And what does this here jog your memory? What do you think that represents? A resistor. And this represents a capacitor. And this represents a, a battery, a voltage source, a power source. Okay, but it's a constant voltage battery. And this represents a switch. And we should have mastered this. You really need to master this concept. And there's a number of things that you could talk about. You could talk about the current through the resistor as a function of time, or you could talk about the voltage across the capacitor as a function of time. There's a number of different ways to represent this. But if I said I'm going to have this initially, uh, the circuits closed, so the battery's connected to both the capacitor and the resistor and I let it sit there for a long time and it charges, what does it charge? Either the resistor gets charged or the capacitor gets charged. The capacitor gets charged. Then in the simulation, I'm gonna open up the circuit. I'm gonna throw that switch, right? I'm gonna, it's now open. The battery's out of play. What will happen to the voltage across the capacitor as a function of time? And so we start here, and you're going to have it fully charged, so it'll have the voltage across the capacitor initially. And will it, uh, this is uh, maybe the first clicker question for today, will it go up and then eventually go down? Will it go stay constant for a long time and then eventually go down? Will it start to decay rapidly and then kind of go to zero? Or will it decay rapidly and undershoot and then come up and then go like this and back and forth? So what will that voltage do as a function of time? Will there be initially an increase in voltage across the capacitor? Or really it'll stay flat for a long time and then come down? Or will it rapidly decrease and kind of go to zero? Or will it rapidly decrease and then kind of undershoot zero volts? This is zero volts, right? zero, kind of have negative volts and back to positive volts and negative volts, but eventually go to zero volts. All right, we're going to stop. And we are going to take a look at the results. And there are the results. That's how we feel. So nobody thinks it's an undershoot, overshoot, undershoot. What does, what does D look like, the solution D remind you of? dynamics and in a dynamics class you had the mass right and then you had a dash pot and you had the spring and guess what you had a second order system you know in all of this class heat transfer is really easy there's no second order systems like you had in dynamics there's just no overshoot undershoot it's it's so much easier this class is so much easier than dynamics and controls it really is 
All right, so that's good. Nobody voted for D. Now the A, kind of up and then down. Nah, one person, okay. B, no, no. It's, it's, what is the solution? The good old C. And somebody says, describe the function that C characterizes. You would say, oh, it's the ratio of the hyperbolic tangent divided by the cosh and to the multiply square. No, what is it? It's a ratio of polynomials. No, no. It's not even sines and cosines. It's just a simple old exponential. It's our favorite exponential. And so this was the correct answer. And we know that we had some response, like the voltage at C was some initial voltage at C, and then we had an exponential to minus maybe A, A T, maybe you like to write it that way, or maybe you write it as T divided by some constant instead of multiplied by some constant. There's not much difference, just constant or divide by the constant, right? Or the favorite way, T divided by a constant tau, tau, T-A-U. We haven't seen that Greek symbol in a while. If you wrote it that way, and we knew that the SI units for time would be maybe seconds, what can you conclude about the SI units for tau? Either A, B, or C. It is dimensionless, tau is dimensionless, or has units a second B, or inverse second. What are the units of this new parameter called tau? All right, we're in. All right, let's stop. Now, uh, to remind me, if, uh, if it's good math, if you can exponentiate uh, something that has units, let's say meters, what do the results of that come in? What are the units on that? Is that meters? If I exponentiate 5 meters, does, I mean, I get e to the 5. My calculator handles that, but I guess I'm the analyst, and I need to be responsible for units. So if I have e to the 5 meters, what is, what are the, you know, not just the magnitude, what are the units on that? Does it make any sense to exponentiate anything that has units? No, it's dimensionless. When you exponent, how about when you take the natural log and other things? Those are dimensionless. It makes sense to have it dimensionless. So if I'm going to have it up here, what does the T over tau have to be? Dimensionless. But since T is in seconds, then tau has to be in seconds to be dimensionless. So the correct answer is B. All right, very good. So now this reminds us of our uh, uh, a name for this. What is the name for tau? Time constant. time constant. It's our time constant. It's how fast a system responds. So you could have a system that went like really fast in time or slow in time in response. And we're going to talk a little bit more. I'm going to come back to that. But it's the same thing when this lump capacitance model. It's just a simple exponential. And that's our thermal system. It's going to look just like that. Strong analogy. So what is our lump capacitance model? Think about a big, large bucket of fluid. And then you take a hot object. You don't have to have hot. You can start with the, the object cold, put it in a warm fluid. But I think it's easier to handle just hot object put into a cold fluid. And then you move it. And you start the clock as soon as you put it into the bucket of large, cold fluid. And then you ask yourself, what does the temperature of the object, single temperature of the object, do as a function of time? It comes in with T initial, and it's exponential. It's going to be just like that. It'll, it'll go, maybe not to zero, it'll go to T infinity, which is the fluid temperature. It'll go to the fluid temperature. After a long time, the object will have the same temperature as the fluid. Now, did I say that this fluid bath was large? So you, if you had a small fluid bath, then it becomes more challenging because the fluid bath is going to heat up as the hot object cools down. It'll reach some equilibrium temperature. We can do the math, but this is the easy. Let's start with the easy. All right, so how do I get this profile? How do I mathematically determine this temperature as a function of time. I need a differential equation and an initial condition. Where am I going to get that differential equation? 
what principles allow me to get that differential equation? I'm going to start with a energy balance. That's right. First law, thermodynamics. Don't have to go very far. So we have a control volume around this object. And we say, oh, the rate of change of energy inside that object with respect to time. How is that energy going to be changing? It is only going to go down due to the rate at which it's convective heat transfer out to the colder fluid. Then you think about a minute, oh, this energy, I learned that. That's internal, kinetic, potential energy. Hey, this is not thermo one. We don't have this high amount of kinetic potential energy. This is heat transfer, just internal energy, right? And then you said, well, I remember that the internal energy is the mass times the specific heat times the temperature minus some reference temperature. That's right. That's good. Somebody said, oh, I remember Montoyville, he emphasized specific heat, C sub P or C sub V. It's a solid object dunked in a fluid. Is there a difference between C sub P and C sub V for a solid object? Solids incompressible? So you can leave the subscripts off. Somebody says, I'm forcing you to put a subscript on. Put P. Because we just have a constant pressure, usually one ATM. One ATM system. One, one atmosphere pressure. I'm going to dunk it in. It's incompressible, so C sub P is equal to C sub B. E. All right? Whole long discussion about that. Okay? But anyway, it boils down to the... The mass comes out, the specific heat comes out, the time rate of change of the temperature. See that? And it's going to go down if you have H, A, then you have T minus T infinity. If T is greater than T infinity, it's going to go down. It's, go it's going to be a decrease in the energy inside that system. Now, somebody worked that out already in a textbook, Professor. And since it's already worked out in somebody else's mind and put in a textbook, I don't think I'm responsible for knowing anything like that in this class. At the end of this class, you know, I shouldn't have to know anything. I shouldn't be able to have to talk about this or analyze it like this. Wrong, wrong, wrong. This is the type of stuff we really want you to dominate and learn, right? It's like, how did I get that equation? Energy balance. Can you write an energy balance for kind of a general system? Can you then do the bookkeeping, do a little manipulation, get it into the right form? We're going to introduce theta, which is the temperature difference, T minus T infinity. In this illustration, that is theta. And so theta starts at T initial minus T infinity and goes to zero. That's a new variable. You can then transform this equation. You'll get D theta dt is equal to minus ha divided by mc theta. That looks a little cleaner because I got rid of the non-homogeneous term. It's a simple first order system. I only need one initial condition that theta at time equal to zero is equal to theta initial which is t initial minus t infinity. Just some value to start the simulation with. All right, so what is the general solution? Now I have the differential equation. I have my initial condition. You're all geared up. What's the next step, mathematician? Separate, integrate. This one really does that. It's very easy to separate, integrate. So you get d theta over theta equal to minus ha divided by mc dt. When we integrate, this becomes the natural log of theta equal to minus HA divided by MC T plus a constant of integration. Apply our initial condition, and we have that C is equal to the natural log of theta initial, because time is zero at the initial condition. And then our final solution is is that theta is equal to theta initial e to the minus h a divided by m c t hey i don't see a time constant what's our time constant is it m c divided by h a is that our time constant yeah our thermal time constant is that it's m c divided by h a 
Okay. Uh, hmm. Um, hmm. Um, that's our exponential function or time constant. Um, hmm. Let me do this. Let me talk a little bit about our favorite function exponential. Uh, what I find is a lot of students kind of don't grasp this. I think it's really important. Uh, really important. Okay. So we have e to the minus t divided by tau. If I just plot that as a function of t, where does it start? If I say y is equal to, you know, or function f is equal to e to the minus t over tau, at time zero, what is my value of that function? One. Very good. After a long time, and I can mark time in measures of tau, one tau, two tau, three tau, four tau, five tau, six tau, and beyond. I can measure time in time constants. It'll go down. Now, will it look like this? Or will it look like this is not so good of a draw? Like that? Or will it look something like that? Or do you have no clue what it looks like, that function? What will it look like? It'll look like the middle one. All right. Let's ask this question. Hmm. If I put in the time of 3 tau, that's e to the minus 3 tau divided by tau. The tau is constant, uh, co uh, cancel. That's e to the minus 3. What is that close to? Is that close to 95%? Clicker answer A. 50%? Clicker answer B. 36% or 33%? Clicker. Clicker answer C, 5% uh, clicker answer D, or 1% clicker answer E. What is E to the minus 3? You know. All right, so if you put in your calculator, what did it come out at? Right, 5%? 95% is already gone. Uh, the delta T is down only 5%. One twentieth is left. A lot of times people will say it's close enough for the action to be done at three time constants. Now, if you're doing electrical systems, they have a little re more refinement. They really may be more interested in five time constant before they call the action done, before the function goes close enough to zero to say it's zero. So if I say, what is e to the minus five, we re-ask that question. Is it 95%, 50%, 33%, 5%, or 1%? Oh, there it is. All right, let's show the results. Yes, some students are. They may give me the impression that they're sleeping, but they're not. They're awake. So it's down to 1%. So, or less than 1%. How many people looked at it? It's around point, what, 7%? Yeah, it's less than 1%. And so this was around 5%. All right? Anybody want to take a guess at 1 tau? It's, it's a little higher than 33%, about a third, like 37%, right? But it, roughly, if you had to say one third, it would be one third. All right. Um, well, there's a couple other things I might want to mention. If you start here and you get the slope right here and you create a straight line, this line is y is equal to mx plus b. The intercept b will be 1, and the slope will be such that when I come out 1 tau, it's equal to 0. It'll go through the x-axis. y will be 0 at a tau of equal to 1. There's a, probably a few other things I could point out about this function. Hopefully, uh, your exponential function is your old friend. It's a good function to dominate and know a lot about. Let's move on. So here it is. This is our solution for that. We have our time constant identified. In this case, tau, it would be rho v. That's the mass, specific heat, divided by h a. Why did they put an s on that a? 
surface area for convection off of that solid object. And you get that exponential function. One thing we didn't do is justify it. Let's go ahead and justify. The easiest way to justify is to think of a very large sheet that's brought out, maybe it's hung up and brought out of an oven and it's very hot. Maybe you think about a four by eight sheet of metal or something, I don't know, huge, big sheet, but it's not that thick, it's pretty thin. And you have convection on both sides of that sheet. And you really can neglect the convection cooling all along these edges. It's really just off of the large faces there. So if we looked at it, we'd say, here is location, here is the center line, here is at negative L, here is at positive L, and our sheet looks like that. I'm just looking projection onward. And on the y-axis, we might want to plot uh, temperature coming up, and we would plot maybe right here. This is the temperature initial. Everywhere in that sheet, it's the same temperature. And then here is temperature of the fluid, T infinity. It's a lower temperature. And what happens as the time progresses is the plate will cool down. And as it cools down, the centermost temperature is the same as at, at, at that instant in time as the surface temperature. It's basically isothermal. It's cooling at this. Now, somebody says, well, why doesn't it cool like this, where the temperature at the center stays uniform and the edge rapidly cools? It then, like that, well, you're getting ahead of us. That's the next section where temperature is going to be a function of time and space. But for now, temperature is just a function of time, not space, and time. Okay. So you say, but doesn't the chunk of little heat right here have to be conducted to the edge before it's convected off of the edge? You're absolutely right. And if it was a chunk over here, it would probably go conduction to the other side. So think about if I'm a little chunk of heat right here, or I have a chunk of metal at the interior that's pretty hot and it needs to be cooled, it's going to be conducted before it's convected out of the system. So to conduct it, you would say, well, that's going to be my resistance to conduction is really needs to be small to compared to the resistance to convect it off of the surface. So conduction within the solid compared to the convection off of the solid. Well, what's my value for the re resistance to conduction within? Isn't that my L divided by Ka? That's why we picked this to be L, the half thickness of the slab. And then that has to be small compared to the resistance convection. Isn't that one over Ha? In this case, isn't this the area in both of those cases? And in those cases, the area can cancel. And what we have is we have uh, HL over K needs to be much, much less than 1, right? Well, <clears throat> the much, much less than 1 in engineering judgment would definitely be a tenth, maybe even larger than a tenth. But nobody's going to be ridiculous and say, oh, it needs to be a millionth, like 0. 0.0000. No, no, look at it. 0.1 is much, much less than 1 in engineering. Okay. So this is a new parameter. It's called the BO number, HL over K. It's a measure of the resistance of con uh, conduction, resistance conduction divided by the resistance convection. Uh, this is the BO number. BO? It would be B-I-O-T in spelling, but the way you pronounce it is B-O. There's a few names and things that I butcher, and I really don't know how to correctly pronounce, but this one is more consistent in the literature. It's, it's the, it sound, looks like the B-O-T number or something, right? But it's B-O. All right. Okay. Okay. All right. I think we already answered this question. What are the units of the time constant, the thermal time constant? Seconds, inverse seconds, degree C per second, second per degree C, or dimensionless. No clicker, just call out the answer. Seconds, that's right. But this one we will handle. All right, let me move this out of the way. 
the initial temperature difference is 50 degrees. Does that say T initial is 50 degrees or, uh, C or theta initial is 50 degrees C? Which one? Theta is our temperature difference. And the time constant is 20 seconds. Does that mean that tau, our thermal time constant? Yeah, that's what our symbol is. What is the temperature difference after a time of 20 seconds? Less than blah, 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 blah. What is Go ahead and answer, please. And we'll take a look at the results. Very good. So why is it 18 degrees? Because theta at the future time of 20 seconds is theta initial, what it begins with, times e to the minus t divided by the time constant. And the, this is 20 seconds over 20 seconds, so it's, it's 50 degrees c times e to the minus 1, about 37% of 50 so it comes in at 18. We're going to get another shot at this if you missed it, okay? Here it goes. Same thing, 50 degrees C for the initial temperature difference, same time constant, 20. But now it's not 20 seconds later, it's 60 seconds later. What is the delta T remaining? I have no idea why my pen is doing that. And show the results. And yeah, it's around two and a half, isn't it? So it was, uh, grade that, grade it correctly. Come on now, put it away. So this turns out to be e to the minus 3, which was about 1 20th, 5%. Percent. 0 0.05 times 50 comes in at about two and a half. Very good. We talked about the validity of the lump capacitance. We checked the BO number. But the BO number needs a length, true? And so we already said that if I have an infinite slab like this, and I talk about the slab thickness as 2L, that characteristic length is the half thickness, half thickness of the slab, because it can go out either side. I could also have a very long cylinder, a wire or something. Hmm, what would be the characteristic thickness for that? Well, you work it out, and the consensus is, is the radius divided by, not the radius, the radius divided by 2. And then you could have a sphere. It's hard for me to draw a sphere, but there's my rendition of a sphere. And the characteristic length of the BO number is the radius divided by 3. And what we find, this is a bad looking too, is that the characteristic length is some volume to surface area ratio. All right? If you come back and you say, well, this is the area on one side, it also has the area on the other side, right? And so what would be my volume to area ratio uh, for this? That would be, the volume would be 2 L times A, and the area would be 2A, they cancel, you just left with half thickness, L. Likewise, you do the, the volume to area ratio for a cylinder. Well, the volume of a cylinder is um, pi R squared times the, the length L, but the area is 2 pi R L, and the pi's go, the l's go, one of the r's go, you're left with r over 2. You get the r over 2. And then the same thing for the uh, sphere. You say, what is the volume of the sphere? Uh, 4 thirds pi r cubed. All right. And then you divide that by the area. 4 pi r squared. And the 4's go, the pi's go. 4 pi r, I put the squ r squared in the wrong place, didn't I? r squared, and then we get um, r divided by 3. So in general, it's the, the characteristic length for the BO number is the volume to area ratio. Okay. 
Well, we were introduced to the BO number, true? What was it again? H? Yeah, uh, if you wanted to, you say volume to area ratio divided by K. All right. Now let's take a look. We have a new, you can look in the table and just, you came out of fluid mechanics and there were a lot of parameters in fluid mechanics. There was C sub D, there was R E, there was this F. All right, uh, help me a little bit. This is probably the easiest one, R E. Reynolds number, dimensionless, ratio of inertial to viscous forces, high Reynolds number, turbulent flow, C sub D. Drag coefficient, yeah. And then F for internal flow in a pipe or conduit, friction factor, friction factor, okay? Now, we're, we already were introduced to, hey, the, the heat transfer is a continuation of this, a love for dimensionless ratios. So we're going to have BO number, and we're also going to have Fourier number. Well, it's the Fourier number defined as, well, it's in a table down here, right here, and this one has the BO number as well. It's alpha T divided by L squared. All right. Well, let's go back and take a look. We had theta is equal to the theta initial E to the minus T divided by the time constant. Okay. What exactly was our time constant? Was that our mass, like rho volume, specific heat, divided by HA, was that it? Yeah, let's do this, was when I see a volume to area ratio, can I replace that volume to area by length? Yeah, all right. Could I multiply this by length over length? That doesn't change anything, it's length over length, right? But then I can uh, maybe multiply by uh, K, might multiply by um, uh, K here, in a K there. Now, let's take a look. Was this my H? Right? Was this an L? And is this a K? So what I circled in purple is a group of parameters, theta I, E to the minus B O. And then I look and I say, well, I don't see an alpha but hold it, isn't alpha K divided by rho C? So the K's cancel, the rho C's cancel. Hey, I do see an alpha. So it's alpha time divided by LL, L squared. That's for a number. So you can make this so it's almost not interpretable anymore is so confused by these dimensionless groups, but there you go. So the theta is equal to theta initial times e to the b o times a Fourier number. All right. I'm going to press forward. So these two sections are very, very important. I lumped capacitance. Talk about the time concept, the analogy with electrical. Uh, talk about the exponential function, 95%, et cetera. We could solve some problems. This part, uh, just go ahead. I'm not going to have any uh, problems on it for uh, uh, exams. It's, it's a little too difficult, a little too challenging. Let's solve this problem. We have a solid 3-centimeter diameter sphere of copper, so the radius is one and a half centimeters, which is 0 0.015 meter. All right, it's copper. Down here, they give us the thermal conductivity of copper, the mass density of copper, and the specific heat of the copper. It's heated in a furnace for a long time until the temperature of the copper is, that's going to be T initial, 80 degrees C. It is abruptly removed from the furnace and exposed to T infinity of 20 degrees C and the convection coefficients given 75 watts per meter squared degree C. How long will it take for the center of the copper to conduct down to, or be cooled down to 50 degrees C? Strategy, check the BO number if you can use lumped capacitance. If the BO number is small, 
then you could use lumped capacitance, can't you? So what's the BO number? H R divided by 3 divided by K. And when you run that number for this problem, the BO number comes in really small. The BO number comes in 0 0.00096. What do you think? Hey, what are the SI units on that BO number? Nothing. Dimensionless. It's like Reynolds number, drag coefficient, friction factor, Fourier number, BO number, all dimensionless. Okay, very good. So now that I have that, you say, what is the, how long will it take for the center to be? So it starts at theta initial, which is 80 minus 20. So that's going to be 60 degrees C. And your theta final, that's what you want to find the final time, is going to be 50 minus 20 degrees C, which is 30 degrees C, isn't it? And our general solution is that the, uh, that the uh, uh, theta final uh, at the time of interest is theta initial e to the minus t divided by tau. So what you have is you have that um, e to the minus t divided by tau is equal to theta final over theta initial. How do I get rid of that exponential? I do the what for both sides? Take the natural log of both sides. Then I have minus t divided by tau is equal to the natural log of the theta final over theta initial. So the time final is equal to the time constant natural log. How do I get rid of this minus sign? Flip what's in the natural log. Theta initial over theta final. So we put in our, we have to calculate our time constant. I need to do that up here, sorry. And we, it's that the HA divided by MC, you got to get the mass of the sphere, et cetera. This is going to come in around 229 seconds. So it's going to be 229 seconds times the natural log. The initial temperature difference is 60. The final temperature difference is 30, natural log of 2. And you calculate the final time as 159 seconds, round it off 160 seconds, and boom, you're done. I went a little fast there, but that's an application of using lump capacitance. Make sure and not forget to justify lump capacitance, because we're going to now talk later about spatial effects. And so if you can get away with justifying lump capacitance, a lot easier. If you have to take care of spatial or consider spatial effects, well, that's just the problem that you have to solve. It's a little more challenging. We'll cover that next time, right? With that, I'm going to go ahead and shut it down and hand back your quizzes.